Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, many of you may know a little bit about mitral regurgitation because it's a, it's a problem that affects uh, a large swath of, of the US and uh, a global population. So for those of you who don't know about mitral regurgitation, I'll give you a little primer on mitral regurgitation. So the left atrium fills with blood, the mitral valve opens, uh, blood flows into the left ventricle, and when the heart squeezes, blood actually flows back into the left atrium rather than outside uh, the aorta. Uh, and so what happens is over time, the situation just gets worse and worse and worse, uh, and patients are fatigued, they're weak, shortness of breath, and the problem just uh, continues to progress and the, then the pump becomes less efficient, uh, and there's really no good treatment options. So this is a problem that's affecting anywhere on the order of 16 million patients in the US and Europe. There's about four million patients walking around that have maxed out medical therapy and are at a point where they need some type of a surgical intervention, whether that be minimal invasive or open surgery. Um, and this problem is only getting worse as the population ages. Uh, and in the near term, uh, the uh, replacement opportunity is, is somewhere around three billion, but by all estimates, this is twice the size of the TAVR market. Um, so it's the number one problem in uh, uh, the valve system within the heart, uh, and it's only getting worse. The current gold standard for treating mitral regurgitation uh, is open surgery. So whether that be repair or full, full replacement, uh, American Heart Association and ESC recommend to, to, in order to fully resolve regurgitation, you need to ha have an open surger, uh, surgery. The problem is these patients usually get too sick after they've maxed, maxed out their medical therapy, uh, and only about 2% of the patients are actually getting the treatment that need it uh, because the procedure's too invasive, uh, poor lift ventricular function, uh, 10 days in the ICU, uh, patients usually can't handle that, so unfortunately, um, most of them go on to expire. This is a, a field of great interest. There's many devices being developed. Many devices were developed and have gone by the wayside, run out of money. Uh, the, the common theme with all of these devices here are that they're using radial force, radial strength of the nitinol frame to fill an orifice. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you how our product differentiates from the rest of the field. Uh, but there's a lot of money flowing in here. It's a big clinical need. All the big strategics are spending money on repair and replace, trying to approach a, um, uh, this from a toolbox perspective. Um, but there's three big challenges that still remain with the devices that are in development right now. Either the device is too small to, to treat the mitral annulus that's, uh, of the patient that's on the table. Um, it's too large, meaning once you deploy the valve, there's too much uh, nitinol frame or valve tissue hanging in the left ventricle, so when the heart squeezes, blood can't exit the left ventricle. Um, and if you don't capture the leaflets and create a nice surgical-like uh, secure fit and prevent the anterior leaflet from blocking flow as the heart squeezes, that can also lead to a problem. So currently, right now, uh, there's the, the three major companies in cardiovascular devices are running clinical trials with devices, and their uh, published data says that there's a 60 to 90 percent screen failure rate in those trials, largely for these, these three reasons. So the Saturn uh, valve was developed by an Italian engineer who spent his entire life developing heart valves. It's the only thing he's ever done from the moment he exited uh, the university in Italy. He's an Italian inventor. Uh, he was the director of R&D at Sorin and Levanova, and then also Symetis, which is a TAVR company. He has more than 30 patents in heart valves, both in delivery systems, TAVR, as well as surgical valves. Um, and that type of mindset to approach a disease that's this complex allows us to develop a device that's specific to the mitral valve, its orientation to the aortic valve, uh, this saddle-like shape, where it's located in the heart, um, it's, it's a difficult disease to treat, um, and we think we have a, a, a solution um, that solves many of the problems leading to high screen failure rates. So our device is a, it's a single low profile unit. We embrace the leaflets, we trap the leaflets in between the central frame and the annular segments, and I'm gonna go into a little detail about the device in a second. Instead of using radial force to expand a, a stent in an orifice, we actually are shrinking the annulus, much like a surgeon would do um, with, with an annuloplasty ring. So we're shrinking the annulus because mitral regurgitation is a function of the left ventricle. The majority of, the, of, of the, the disease out there is caused because the left ventricle 
is, is, is compromised because of a heart attack and the left ventricle expands and the leaflets can't co together. And so um, our thought is you need to address the left ventricle, reverse the annulus, and then deploy the central element. So do what a surgeon does during an annuloplasty um, would be a gold standard in this therapy because it would fully resolve and it would remodel the left ventricle. Also, uh, being super low profile, we don't obstruct uh, blood flow leaving the ventricle. So I'll go a little bit more detail there. So it's characterized by these um, three components. We have a subvalvular uh, st structure called the annular segments, and there's a connecting arm. And so these annular segments lock into the connecting arms before the central element is deployed to create one singular unit. So the way this differentiates from other devices is that we control the location of the ring. So we control where in the ventricle our device is deployed. Um, so I'll go into a little bit of the preclinical data, but we think that offers a significant advantage and minimizes paravalvular leakage uh, seen with some of the other devices. So we have the lowest profile device uh, in development right now. It's only 13 millimeters high after uh, it's deployed in the left ventricle. We have minimal atrial perfusion or protrusion, um, which can be a breeding ground. Can you go back to the last slide? The atrial protrusion, if there's a lot of fabric flowering in the left atrium, can be a breeding ground for thrombosis. Um, we have a single 28 millimeter stent size. All of the other competitors are developing 28, 30, 35, 36, 40, 50 millimeters to try to use radial force to just fill the orifice. Uh, where we're shrinking the annulus with a single 28 millimeter prosthetic, which actually happens to be the standard size that's used during surgical mitral valve replacement. And we also have developed a stent that we've put in both transapically and transfemorally. So how does it work? The annular segments are placed behind the, uh, behind the uh, posterior and the anterior leaflets. The, the central frame is locked in with these connecting arms into the annular um, segments. Then the central frame is deployed inside the orifice and we trap the native leaflets. So it, it creates a shrinking effect and funneling effect of the, of the patient's natural uh, native mitral annulus. Uh, and then we trap it, creating a surgical-like fit. So again, one size fits all. It promotes reverse remodeling, surgical-like anchoring, uh, and surgical-like resizing. So this is an example of how we differentiate our technology versus our competitors. On the left is a, is a, is a, a swine model, animal lab. We've done this in 40 sheep. Uh, an additional 20 pigs, um, same result of the shrinking of the annulus. So this is a short axis echo view, looking at uh, the pigs, a commissioner to commissioner 48 millimeter annulus. And post deployment of our valve, you can see the shrinking much like a surgeon would do during an annuloplasty. And post explant, you see uh, uh, perfect deployment of the valve and minim minimal atrial perfusion. The other unique feature of our device is this connecting arm. We're the only company that actually has this connecting arm that connects the two annular segments with the central frame, and that allows us to trap the anterior leaflet. So mitral regurgitation can be caused by the ventricle, or it can also be caused by the valve wearing out itself. And organic regurgitation, which is the valve wearing out, this leaflet can come, become quite long, and so when a new prosthetic is put in, that can block blood flow, but we're trapping that leaflet. Uh, and preventing that leaflet from blocking flow out of the ventricle. This is a, this is a CT scan. They're running these uh, pre-screening CTs where they overlay devices in the patient's um, CT scan to see, okay, would this device actually fit? So this is a competitive device, and you can see, imagine if this ventricle were to squeeze, there's, how's blood flow gonna escape out of this ventricle? Um, it's virtually impossible, so this patient would screen out of the trial. Versus our device, super low profile, shrinking the annulus, pulling the anterior leaflet away from the aortic valve, creates an environment where you have plenty of blood flow that can escape from the left ventricle. So how do we put our device in? It's characterized by this, um, one more back, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, we have a catheter that has intellectual property around it and allows us to guide a catheter right behind the middle posterior leaflet uh, of the mitral annulus, and we follow blood flow using standard off-the-shelf guide wires to embrace the, the, the uh, mitral valve with two half loops. Then once we deliver those two half loops around the mitral annulus, 
Um, we put the annular segments in in the central element. This is the valve that's deployed in a sheep and a pig. As I said, we've done more extensive preclinical work um, and chronic preclinical work, both in sheep and pigs. We've done 60, 90, 150 day animal models. All of the animals survived the duration of the study on uh, warifin for 30 days and then aspirin alone. And the results are in every single animal that, um, geo, uh, chronic uh, study that we've done, the same. At explant, perfect endothelialization, no calcification, no thrombus formation, limited penis overgrowth, no lesions. The procedure is it, it, it's very safe and reproducible, um, and it's fast. We've trained seven physicians now to do this in preparation for our clinical trial. Uh, and after the, the, their uh, procedure was frozen, we've had a 96% success rate uh, in our, uh, our preclinical uh, training sessions. Our average procedure time in our GLP studies is under 45 minutes. We capture all of this data uh, and can make it available to anybody that wants to see it. So in summary, uh, this device addresses the challenges seen by other devices that are causing high screen failure rates. And we have a unique approach where we shrink the annulus rather than taking a stent frame and trying to expand it within an orifice. Our current uh, IP portfolio is very strong. We're protected in every major geography. The current timeline for our device is we will enter the clinic with a transapical device in Q2 this year. All of the sites are trained. We have regulatory approval to begin that study. It's to validate the prosthetic that we're gonna use for the transeptal. It's the same valve, both transapical and transeptal. And then uh, at the end of 2021, our plan is to enter the United States and the EU, and, uh, EU with our transfemoral system with a EFS and a pilot study. Huge exits uh, in this space, as I'll get to in a second. Um, but we are looking for $33 million to take us to our milestones. Um, that's to get to clinical quality with the transfemoral system and begin the early feasibility study in Q4 next year. Uh, and a transapical, small transapical study up to 20 patients uh, in Eastern Europe that'll begin at the beginning of Q2. Uh, again, there's a lot of money flowing in here, two and a half billion uh, dollars in acquisitions in repair and replace. Uh, and most uh, uh, strategics and, and physicians that you talk to will t say that this is a, a toolbox approach to treat this, this disease because it's so complex. Um, this is Giovanni Regini, our founder. Uh, an Italian guy who spent his entire life in heart valves. It's worth mentioning Keith Dawkins, our chairman, very active chairman. He was the former chief medical officer at Boston Scientific for 10 years, an interventional cardiologist, Stanford trained, um, sits on the board of many companies uh, and is the chairman of Interheart. Uh, and Paolo Fondaro, who's also our vice chairman, he's the chairman of the, of the board at Intercept Pharmaceuticals. So we believe uh, the Saturn's the next uh, frontier in minimally invasive structural heart interventions. Thank you.